Thank you. Great meeting you. I think what we'll do uh, next is go directly into the the public uh, participation phase uh, of the workshop. We'll have uh, open microphones. Uh, John Farrell from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and I think my colleague Bill Stallings from the Department of Justice will uh, sit up here and uh, listen to your comments. Uh, and John will probably describe a little bit more about what the what the rules will be. Thank you all. Please try to draw the mics up to you and have them too far away. Okay. It's very hard to pick up. Thank you. Well, I think we will go ahead and get started for uh, the public testimony section of today. Um, we will, we will per, uh, have people provide comments uh, that want to come up to the microphone for the next hour and then at 1230 we'll go to lunch then. Um, so what we'll do is, is uh, if you wanted to provide a comment, uh, we had tickets out front that you could get. Um, and what we'll do is um, if you have a ticket and want to provide a comment to line up on either one of the microphones up front here, um, we're going to ask that you limit your comments to two minutes each, uh, and we do so just so we can ensure to get as many people as possible who want to provide a comment to be able to do so. We do have a, a timer over here, and he'll help keep track of, of our time and make sure we're getting as many people through as we possibly can because we want to hear from as many as you as possible. So again, if you want to provide a comment, go ahead and come up to the microphone and we will can go ahead and get started. Right over here. Good morning. I assume this is on. Yes, it is. Uh, my name is Ed King and I'm a dairyman from uh, New York State, eastern edge of the state. And uh, I sit on the board of directors of the Dairy League Cooperative. I was fortunate enough to be able to offer the opportunity back in June to testify uh, in Madison. And uh, I really appreciate the fact uh, that the interest in uh, both the Department of Justice and USDA continues uh, in the uh, dairy industry and its economic viability. So I'm, we really appreciate that. And <clears throat> second of all, I really appreciate the fact that we have uh, strong support, has been uh, voiced by both the, uh, the Secretary and the Attorney General uh, for um, the uh, Capra Volstead Act. That's extremely important to us as cooperative members going forward. Uh, <clears throat> my, uh, a couple of my main points in Madison were the fact that 
that retailers, large retailers, supermarkets, are, are able to extract concessions from um, uh, processors that say, well, okay, here's the price, and these are the movers in the price of the contract, but then when it, it's all finished, uh, the uh, supplier has to keep, quote unquote, keep the, uh, the, the, the retail marketer um, um, competitive. <clears throat> Those same demands are passed from the processor back to the cooperative, therefore to the farmer. And uh, it's, uh, it's pretty clear. The farmer doesn't have anyone to turn to uh, to keep them competitive. We've heard a lot of discussion here, to, and I think that's, that's an area that certainly needs investigating. We've heard a lot of discussion about price and margins, et cetera. I would tell you that uh, the comment that was made about New York State's uh, anti-gouging law is the fact that there is a law, but currently it's not being enforced. Uh, I assume that's because of budgetary restrictions and lack of personnel, et cetera, but the state of New York would be better off commenting on that than I. But I know for a fact that that, that anti-gouging law is not being enforced uh, in New York. And <clears throat> we've had a lot of good testimony, but another, another certainly uh, extremely important factor in all of this is that uh, um, we talk about margins, but the spread between the farmer and retail, but uh, no one has spoken about, only in a, in, a, in a tertiary way, about how drastically the cost of production of milk on farms uh, has increased. And if those, that factor is not taken into consideration, um, then some of the margins that are quoted are, are, are meaningless until you, until you take a look at that. So the, those are the points, and, and again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and the focus of attention uh, that you folks have given uh, to the dairy industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over here. I have to turn it on? Or? It's on. It's on. It's on? Okay, good. Hi, I'm Joel Greeno, dairy farmer from Kendall, Wisconsin, and I also had an opportunity to be on the panel in Madison, Wisconsin, June 25th. And just would like to remind everyone that rural America is in serious trouble, uh, that our small communities are failing because the farmers that live around those communities don't have any money. And especially my area of dairy, things are extremely bad, you know, due to the last two years of extremely low prices. I've seen more farm equipment hauled off to the salvage yard than I've ever seen ever before. I've seen dairy farmers sell their corn crop because it's the only thing they had that was of any value. And I don't know if they're banking on a better milk price by spring, which the way it looks isn't likely, or they're planning on selling their cows soon because in Wisconsin, once you're out of feed and that with cold weather, the situation's drastic. And so we need the milk pricing system fixed. If we want young farmers to come into the industry, they need to be paid a living. Everyone in the chain can adjust their margin accordingly and earn a living, except for the farmer. And if antitrust division and USDA doesn't step it up and ensure that farmers earn a living first and everyone else adjusts their margins accordingly thereafter, the entire system will fail, rural America will fail, our farmers and our nation as a whole will fail, just because our whole infrastructure relies on our farmers who produce 70% of our, the world's raw material and, and we're absolutely vital. And, you know, we're dependent on and we're the people that create the economic activity that creates jobs and puts people back to work and all that needs to be taken into consideration when all these decisions are being made. And for dairy farmers, you know, time is critical and these decisions need to be made in short order and far sooner than the 2012 Farm Bill. And ongoing investigations need prompt attention, such as the one into Dairy Farmers of America, Dean Foods, and National Dairy Holdings that I've spoke of before. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Kathy Mulvey speaking on behalf of the Community Food Security Coalition, uh, which includes more than 400 social and economic justice, anti-hunger, environmental uh, community development, sustainable agriculture, 
community gardening, gardening and other organizations who are working to catalyze uh, food systems that are healthy, sustainable, just, and democratic by building community voice and capacity for change. And um, really uh, alarming levels of, of corporate, of concentration in agriculture and lack of enforcement of uh, antitrust regulations and laws are inhibiting development of, of our local and regional food systems. Our members are concerned about corporate consolidation in the agriculture and production and retail sectors um, because it negatively affects both producers and consumers. Producers are receiving less of the retail dollar and consumers paying more for food. And in an industry that's dominated by a handful of corporations, we're finding producers struggling for access to markets, land, fair wages, and non-GMO seeds, and consumers struggling for access to affordable healthy food, transparent food origination information, market diversity, and in rural and limited air, income areas, particular concern about lack of access to healthy food, health, healthy grocery stores. So um, really after, now is the time um, to move from study to, to action um, to ensure that, that consumers and farmers receive fairness in the marketplace. Um, so we're, we're encouraged by this process. Um, we look forward to seeing D DOJ and USDA work together to enforce antitrust legislation, to stop anti-competitive behavior, and also to recommend new laws coming out of this process to encourage more regionally based food infrastructure. Thank you very much. My name is Paul Sobosinski. I'm a crop and livestock farmer from southwest Minnesota. I'm with the Land Stewardship Project and I'm now producing hogs for Nyman Ranch. In my neighborhood, where there was once 10 of us producing hogs, I'm the only one left. I want to be clear that the National Pork Producer Council does not represent me as an independent pork producer. In my opinion, with my money and on their watch, 90% of the hog producers have been eliminated since I've been farming. So what do independent family farmers need? We need better market access. We need real discovery of price and terms of sales being offered for livestock. We need real fairness. We need USDA to swiftly enact the enforced the proposed GYPSA rules. I like to tell a story and I hope that maybe you can remember. It's my pie story. When my mom made a pie for our family, with seven kids in the family, that pie was divided up all equally. Right now, both USDA and Justice have got to decide with the GYPSA rule. Are you going to take that pie, are you going to put that hand of the pie on the hand of Walmart and the multinational packers, put your hand on them, and guide that, that, that pie slicer back to fairness, just like my mom did for each of us, so that farmers get a fair share of that pie? That's what needs to happen also needs to happen if you can't get their hand moved over for fairness, Walmart's hand moved over for fairness, along with the Packers, you need to take that slicer and start cutting them up and splitting them up. They don't need to be that big if they can't be fair. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Meyer. I'm an industry consultant and an analyst. Uh, I run a company called Paragon Economics in Iowa. Uh, I'd like to bring a couple of points to the, uh, to the attention of the panel today. And the first two are really about the elephant in the room. I've been to four of these things, and it seems as though everybody forgets that uh, one of the best ways to help the livestock, poultry, dairy, and egg industries in the eastern United States would be for USDA to quit working against meat and, meat and animal protein demand by promoting uh, other diets through the, uh, through the dietary pyramid, the food guide pyramid, and other ways. Uh, we don't feel like you've done us very much good on that count. The second elephant in the room is the fact that over the last five years, the number one determinant and the number one damage to profitability in the livestock and egg and, and dairy industries and poultry has been the run-up in feed costs due to the subsidization of, of ethanol production from corn. 
if you want to help profits, do something about that and help our costs get back to a more reasonable and put us on an evil, even playing field on buying corn. The last point I would make is that these price spreads that we're talking about today are spreads. They do not indicate profits. The major component of any of the prices that you talk about in the ERS price spread data is costs. There's a lot more costs there than there are profits. And one of the ways that USDA can help in keeping price spreads low is to make sure they don't add to our cost in some fashion. Uh, this, with this in mind, it doesn't mean do nothing, but it does mean do what you do carefully. You know, the Hippocratic Oath says first do no harm, and I would really urge you to do that in this case as well. Price spreads are wide for some goods because the finished good doesn't look very much like the, the good that comes off of the farm. In the case of beef and pork, for example, the farmer's share of the pork dollar is lower because there's a lot more processing that goes into pork than there is to beef. And so the, the, the level of these price spreads in and of themselves don't mean very, very much. They're f the function of how much processing needs to be done to a given good and the cost of doing it. Uh, you can help us by making sure that you don't add to those costs. Uh, good, mor good morning. I'm Wes Schumeyer. I'm a family farmer from northeast Missouri, and uh, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit. The last time I was out here was 12 years ago, and we were talking about cool and those type of pro and mandatory price reporting. Today we're here, uh, and the two words we hear today are fairness and competition. And I'm going to shift gears just a little bit and talk about the supply side. There is nothing... Uh, in this country that eliminated competition and created a monopoly faster than a general utility patent. And I'm going to talk about our seed industry and the access that we have to seed. And what needs to happen is one of two things. If you're not going to have competition, which that patent ha has eliminated, then we need to seek the fairness. And there's two ways that we can grab that fairness if we have the political will. One is to go back and visit the Plant Variety Protection Act and allow farmers to retain their own seeds once again, which would create competition and fairness in the market. The other thing, I was just reading my uh, Blackberry uh, uh, from Missouri. I read the headlines. It said, the Public Service Commission celebrates 97 years of operation. When the Public Service Commission was created, it was to regulate those things that are so important to us, like electricity, uh, water, uh, but we allowed monopolies to happen in Missouri. But we said, if we are going to allow a monopoly to exist, there has to be fairness to consumers. And we force those monopolies to open their books, justify their costs, so that there is fairness to those people that they are selling to. We either need to have the political will to create a public service commission for intellectual property in this country, to force them to open their books, to justify their investment in the cost, because since the time of Roundup Ready uh, and, the, and, the, and the tech charge has gone up from $6 to well into the 20s with no additional investment by the holder of that patent. It is time for fairness uh, on this side of the market, too. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rudy Arredondo, president of the National Latino Farmers and Ranchers Trade Association. And one of the things that we truly uh, would uh, uh, want to express our appreciation to, to uh, Secretary Bailsack and uh, General Holder for getting us to this juncture because in the past we couldn't even get past that door. So it is uh, important that at this juncture that the leadership continue to move forward and ensure that those markets are regulated. We are continuing to, in, in, if we're small producers, so we have a tremendous amount of concern with regard to this concentration and these monopolies in poultry, beef, and pork, and we would like to have the Department of Agriculture look towards, uh, you know, those small producers who are really trying to re retrofit the decimation that this concentration has done to our rural infrastructure. And you know, sharecropping has uh, has become uh, contracting on steroids with regard to this uh, this monopolies that have have. Uh, uh, be, as, that has uh, uh, that are now in place. So I appreciate very much if you continue to do this, and we'll be willing to be very helpful to you as you move forward. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is David Cooper and I represent Family Dairies USA, a dairy cooperative in the upper Midwest based in Madison, Wisconsin. But more importantly, I'd like to say that I've spent 44 years in agriculture. My parents have a farm. My brother is a fourth generation farmer and so I've been in agriculture and around dairy farmers all my life. They work hard. They reinvest in their operations and they support local communities. Agriculture, specifically the dairy industry, has changed a great deal in the past 10 years with vertical integration, operational size, and profit in their operations. The percentage return to producers in these products has been reduced greatly over those years. Despite operational efficiencies obtained on the farms, which has helped reduce costs and provide greater supply to, the, to support the growing population, input costs relating to that has increased dramatically when you talk about feed and fuel and fertilizers who have skyrocketed over the past several years because of the energy policies that are being introduced or competition that's being uh, increased. So the ability for producers to obtain equal percentages or even greater percentages from the marketplace are not required or have not occurred. Uh, someone not the producer of the product has reaped huge rewards over the years. I'd like to illustrate a few things to bring this to light. The consumer price index for whole fresh milk based on U.S. city averages from 2000 to 2010 showed that in year 2000 the price of a gallon of milk was $2.78. At the time, class one in the Midwest price to the farmer was $13.35 per hundredweight versus $32, per, $32 per hundredweight that that gallon of milk would have equated to. With premiums to producers, the farmers received $1.26 of that $2.78, leaving a balance of $1.52. When I fast forward that 10 years, the price for a gallon of milk is $3.11, and producers are receiving approximately $1.25, leaving the balance at $1.85, or 5% disappearing. I want to explore a little bit in the cheese market, because that's certainly what the Midwest is uh, familiar with, and, and a large amount of that coming from there. Cheddar cheese has a standard of identity. You can buy it on the CME for $1.50 a pound. Producers basically are getting um, about $1.60 a pound, yet it's being sold in the store anywhere from $3.39 to $6.38 a pound. There is a spread there, and I recognize that all cheeses aren't created equal. This, the standard used to be 10 pounds uh, per 100 pounds of milk. Some vats are coming out with 15 pounds per 100 pounds of milk. So there is a difference there. And when you see spreads of anywhere from $22 to $47 per 100 weight for that same milk that's being made into that cheese, someone is making that money. And I realize that dairy producers can't reap all of that. There's certainly energy costs that processors and, and the food chain has experienced, but the difference that producers have experienced as well is greater. Price discovery and transparency in those systems need improvement. And they need improvement because the fabric and the backbone of the America uh, that we know, being agriculture, will not survive without it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Marsha ichi Eitemann from Pesticide Action Network, PAN, a global network of scientists, family farmers, consumers, and farm workers working towards a fair and healthy food system. PAN has 35,000 supporters in the U.S., many of whom have written to us this past week, bringing us messages to share with this workshop. Our supporters are deeply concerned about the fact that right now, the top six chemical companies control 75% of the global pesticide industry. And one corporation, Monsanto, controls 60% of the U.S. corn and soybean seed supply. This level of consolidation is unprecedented and it's dangerous. Our supporters are concerned in particular about lack of access. Farmers today can barely access non-GMO seeds. This lack of market choice deprives farmers of any real control over what to plant and how to tend their crops. Meanwhile, the agricultural biotech industry has lobbied aggressively to prevent labeling of food products containing GMOs or pesticides. But American consumers want to know what's in and on our food, how it's produced, where it's produced, in order that we can make informed choices about how to feed our families. Health and, and safety. 
Local and organic farmers and ranchers have a hard time finding markets for their products. They can't get a fair price from corporate buyers. They have a hard time getting a fair deal for a supermarket shelf space. And on the other hand, consumers have difficulty finding, accessing, and affording healthy local and organic food. What is available in our large supermarkets tends to be highly processed food-like products linked to obesity and diabetes that ultimately cost us as consumers more in healthcare expenses, in lost employment capacity, and reduced quality of life. Our supporters are also deeply concerned about threats to the environment posed by corporate agriculture. It's this kind of agriculture that poisons our air and water, wears out our soil, uh, threatens biodiversity, and the very ecosystem functions on which agriculture depends and weakens food security. It does not have to be this way. There are other ways of farming that are sustainable and highly productive, less costly to the environment and public health. Farmers just need a fair chance in a far, fair marketplace to make this happen. And that brings me to my final point, fairness. Our supporters want fair prices for farmers and ranchers and fair wages for farm workers. We want an end to the revolving door between the ag lobby, corporate actors, and the government agencies that are responsible for regulating the industry. It's this kind of, of corruption that enables corporations to indirectly set public policy for their benefit at the expense of ordinary farmers, workers, consumers, and the environment. In some Pesticide Action Network and our supporters are urging the Justice Department, having had a year to review the evidence, to take decisive action, vigorously enforce existing antitrust laws, break up Monsanto's monopoly control, and give farmers back the right to, to freely save and exchange seed. So in essence, we are urging public agencies and lawmakers to return control of agriculture to the real farmers and ranchers of America, restore fairness to our food and agricultural markets, and allow consumers to have a real meaningful choice, and all consumers at all income levels, to buy healthy food at affordable prices. Thank you very much. Thank you. I do, I do ask if you can keep your comments to two minutes, just out of fairness to everybody. So, um, right over here. My name's Peter Michelson. My wife and I own a ranch, cattle ranch, uh, near Lewistown, Montana. And I'm here in uh, strong support of the proposed GYPSA rules. Uh, I'm going to tell a quick little story because it is absolutely typical, not atypical, of what's happened in rural America. When I first owned my first calf and was responsible for the raising of that calf in 1942, our ranch today was three ranches then supporting four families. The three owner families and one ranch had a, a full-time hired family. Today, that same ranch cannot support one family. And there is one reason, and one reason only, and it's been very well spelled out by the Secretary and by the Attorney General, and that is we do not have a fair marketplace. As a matter of fact, it's not only unjust, I consider it dishonest and illegal. Why? Because it's controlled by monopoly. Now, USDA knows this. The Department of Justice knows this. Most of us in this room know this. And it's now time to act and put these proposals uh, into effect. Uh, I would like to make a couple comments about uh, some of the things we heard from the panelists this morning. If anyone in this room thinks that we have a fair, competitive market it's a myth. And one other thing, if anyone in this room thinks we have the best marketing system for our livestock, they're very well ill-informed. Uh, I've lived a good part of my life overseas, and I can tell you that this monopoly, four companies controlling over 80 percent of the red meat, and uh, I think I've, I've said my piece. I thank you. But let's, uh, let's do the action. USDA and the Department of Agriculture have had since 1921 to do something about this. And it not, has not been done. And now you're doing it. Do it. Hi. My name is Stephen Wagner. I'm a student from Bar Harbor, Maine. And I'm also a volunteer with Slow Food. 
And I do this because I want to see a food system that is fair and equitable for all actors in the food system. That includes growers, producers, consumers, retailers, and also the future generations. And specifically, I'm here as a consumer because I'm concerned about the safety of our food supply. There was a panelist previously who said it was the safest food supply in the world and a high quality of life. With all due respect to the gentleman, I would like to see what those definitions of safe and quality are because that is not what Americans have been seeing. Every year, this country has 5,000 people die and over 300,000 people hospitalized for food contamination. And the link between our food, the safety of our food supply and corporate consolidation is very clear. The bigger the farms, the larger the distribution. The larger that distribution, the accountability and the transparency disappear, and an outbreak cannot be controlled as it can on a smaller farm. This is why, this is why an outbreak from just two egg laying facilities only a couple months ago led to a recall of over half a billion eggs nationwide. I am not alone in my concern. I am speaking for over 10,000 people who signed a slow food petition that demanded the government take action and create a safe food system for this country. 5,000 deaths a year is not only outrageous, but it is preventable. Therefore, I ask the DOJ to please enforce existing antitrust legislation that will begin to break up the corporate consolidation and take a significant step forward in ensuring our nation's food supply. Again, I thank you for your time and this opportunity to speak. Good morning. I'm Chris Sanders with the Food and Commercial Workers Union in Kentucky. I'm here with all these gold shirts down front. Um, I've been to several of these hearings. I've been to Normal, Alabama and to Fort Collins, Colorado, and, and I want, really wanted to be here in Washington, D.C. to talk about profit margin, talk about the retailer. But first I wanted to say a word about fear. When we were in Normal, Alabama, a grower stepped up to the microphone and said, I'm speaking for another who is afraid to speak for fear of retaliation. And I really appreciate it. It's one of the kindest things I've ever seen. The Attorney General, uh, running that hearing from the Justice Department, took that man aside and said, you speak freely without fear of retaliation. Nothing will, no harm will come to you or anyone else you speak for. And that kind of reassurance has emboldened many, many people to speak freely in these hearings with the trust that our government can provide. But since I've been to these hearings, I've talked to several of our major suppliers with whom we have collective bargaining agreements. I'm talking about names that you know, names that have been mentioned in this room and in other hearings, who said, I appreciate you speaking up about the tyranny of the retailer. In fact, I was the first person to name Walmart in these hearings. I appreciate you speaking up about the tyranny of the retailer in these hearings because we're afraid to do that. So it's two things I want to say to Justice and to the suppliers. Please assure everyone under, these, under this flag and under God that they can speak freely without fear of retaliation in their business relationships. And to the suppliers, do like us in our gold shirts. Stand up. Speak freely. If you feel like you're being treated unfairly, participate in these hearings and explain what you think about the retailers. Thank you. Good morning. I'm uh, Michael Sly. I work for the Rural Advancement Foundation International. We are a not-for-profit foundation dedicated to equity, justice, and sustainability in agriculture. We trace our roots back to the last Great Depression where solutions such as the reform of shell croppers' rights, the establishment of supply management and parity, legislation for agriculture helped mightily to pull both agriculture and our country out of the last great crisis. Now is the time to provide such leadership again. If the goals of this process are aimed at restoring resilience, fairness, and economic prosperity to our rural communities and to family farmers that we are so indebted, then we must cut to the core of this ongoing crisis. I call for several of the key things that we need to get to the bottom of. 
First, we need to rapidly decentralize our packing, processing, cleaning, slaughter facilities to ensure that the value-added dollars flow back to the desperately needed rural communities. Secondly, we need to reinvigorate public cultivar and breeds development through classical plant breeding to ensure that farmers and consumers have choice and tools to meet the regional climate adaptation, the challenges of nutrition, and growing demand for healthier, fresher fibers, foods, and fuel choices. We need to repeal utility patents on seeds, breeds, and planting stock as these patents are wholly inappropriate for agriculture and present monopolistic control over the very building blocks of our food system and have paralyzed real research innovation, scientific exchange, and have been a very costly failure. Farmers should not be renters of patented germplasm, but seed savers of a glo global heritage. We should also not only enforce strong gypsum rules, but we must create federal rights and protections for all farmers and workers to fair contracts and licensing agreements, whether as individuals or in associations. We must also mitigate the growing market and ecological crisis due to GMO contamination and shift this liability back to the patent holders. We must enforce antitrust powers where appropriate, and we must, in the future, have public evaluation on such considered mergers prior to any such considerations. And we must also develop transparent and full cost analysis of our food system so that we incorporate the currently externalized cost so that we get at the real full cost accounting of our food system because it is not antithetical for farmers and workers to have fair prices and for consumers to have reasonable prices. And finally, we must ensure the next generation of family farmers through the expansion of beginning and reentry programs for farmers back into agriculture. We need one-stop, full-shop type models. To be clear, minor tweaking and adjustments and recommendations will not get us there. If we are to create the kind of renaissance needed, we must do justice. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Lee Ramsberg, and I have a 100 cal dairy farm in southern Pennsylvania. I'm here this morning to testify as to the need for dairy cooperatives in this country today. In my area, there are four or five dairy cooperatives active and lots of independents. I chose DFA because I think they are the most concerned about keeping their producers in business. I use for an example, they have a grazing program uh, which educates farmers on grazing management, which is a viable option for a lot of struggling farmers uh, nationwide. They also have extensive education on risk management, which helps to minimize the volatility that we're experiencing in the dairy uh, price cycling today. They also have field staff that help you work out quality and management problems on your individual farms. DFA is big enough that it has research and development that allows them to explore new uses for milk and expanded dairy products. I think that dairy cooperatives are the essence and the structure of milk management in this country today. And without them, I don't know who would perform all these functions that I've just named, and this is just a partial list. And I think that without them, the milk marketing would be chaotic in this country. Thank you for listening to me.
My name is Megan Lott. I work with the Community Food Security Coalition. Um, a comment was made this morning on um, people are now spending less on food now than they have in the past, and I just want to speak to that um, because I think the reality of that is that the food that people can afford is bad for them. It's not healthy. I'm also a registered dietitian. I've worked with clients, senior citizens, who I've seen been in their homes making tuna noodle casserole from cat food because that was an available cheap option. I've seen them making tomato soup from a bottle of Heinz ketchup because they could get more price-wise out of volume by watering that bottle of ketchup down than buying a can of soup in the grocery store or buying fresh produce. The reality is a lot of low-income Americans live in quote-unquote food deserts and don't have access to healthy food options. More people are dying today from diet-related chronic disease than any other cause of death. If we don't have healthy food options available, affordable, how can they make the right choice? The contrast between this industrialized, high-yield, corporate food production and growing world hunger suggests that it is time to reevaluate the effectiveness of a dominant industrial agribusiness model that is not solving the problem of hunger. Please don't let these workshops be the last step in this examination. We need more action to ensure that people, all people, have access to affordable, high-quality, healthy food items. Thank you. My name is Alicia Harvey, and I'm here representing Farm Aid. Farm Aid is a nonprofit organization who has worked for 25 years to keep family farmers on the land and thriving. We hear from farmers and ranchers every day, and we're concerned by the stories we're hearing of increased economic pressures, intimidation, and unfair contracting terms farmers faced, at least in part, from an overly concentrated agricultural <coughs> market. We're also concerned about the impact this has had on rural communities. America's farmers are the foundation of our economy, and as hundreds of thousands of farmers have been forced off their land, from both rising production costs and downward pressure on the prices they receive, jobs disappear, rural wealth disappears, and the fabric of rural communities are eroded. Lastly, we're concerned by what we hear from the general public, from consumers who want to support America's family farmers and want good food, but don't know how to do so in a marketplace that lacks transparency and has too few options, too few retailers, too few corporations, um, masked by the appearance of thousands of brands. We are encouraged by the development of new market models that have developed despite these pressures, local and regional markets, and other arrangements that deepen the relationship between farmers and consumers. <coughs> Yet these markets are also stymied by the marketplace. The point is, there is a real problem here. Please do not take your eye off that mark. Please take strong action after this year of study. Please pass and implement the GYPSA rule. Please follow through on the Department of Justice investigations in the dairy industry and release the results of your investigation. Encourage the Federal Trade Commission to join both the DOJ and USDA and this task force on antitrust issues in agriculture, including retail markets. And please recommend laws that encourage regionally based food infrastructure that will give farmers a fair shake. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Mitten. I am a consumer and a small-scale food producer from Huntington, Long Island, and member of NOFA New York, Slow Food, and the Long Island Small Farm Initiative. I'm here to say that myself and many other consumers on Long Island wants to pay farmers, growers, and ranchers the real cost of food. Earlier today, Eric Lieberman of the Food Marketing Institute and earlier this fall, Sec Secretary Vilsack on the Colpair Report touted the fact that Americans spend less of their disposable income on food than just about anybody on the face of this earth. This is not something to be proud of and is incredibly short-sighted. I do not want cheap food because I prioritize the future over the present. I prioritize my current and future health, the future health of the children that I will bear, the economic health of farmers, and the ecological health of our country and our world. I only earn an average income, and I am able to buy good quality food because I prioritize it and do not purchase other things that are associated with a high standard of the living, like Starbucks lattes, iPhones, and even home ownership. I want to pay the real cost of food on 
a real cost of high quality food like raw dairy, meat and eggs raised from pastured animals, and produce raised in nutrient dense soils. If I can purchase a product, if I can't purchase a product from a farmer I know, then I'm going to have to turn to the food industry and a food producer from farther away. But how am I going to make these decisions? Brands and distinctions like natural, cage-free, antibiotic-free, and even organic are just baby steps in the quality that I and many other consumers are looking for. They do not represent the quality that Americans are demanding. Take, for example, an egg. When I crack an egg and open it, I ask myself, how, in, how much integrity does that eggshell have? How vivid orange is the egg yolk? How firm and upright is that egg yolk? The goal of cheap food in the United States is only weakening our country, not strengthening it. Hi, I'm Tanika Cunningham. I'm the Executive Director of Healthy Solutions. And I bring you greetings also from Saffron, the Southeastern African American Organic Network. <clears throat> I like to speak today because I've heard a few things um, about the price of food and what Healthy Solutions does is that we work with communities of color to be able to impact themselves by helping by sourcing directly from farmers into the community. And I hear a lot of things about the price of food and everyone talks about inner cities. We're here in DC where we function and work. They talk about dairy coming in two cases a lot and no one wants to purchase it. But a lot of our retailers and our stores, those prices aren't real. When you go to a corner store in DC, the price of milk is $5.89. The price of an orange is a dollar each. So when we talk about, and they're gone off the shelves because people have to eat. There's a link and a disconnect from farm to community. Myself, I'm the only African American female to ever own a produce distribution company. I moved about 100,000 pounds of produce a day to the military troop support and schools. But within that role, I realized the disconnect in our communities and there needs to be a bridge of a gap. It makes no sense that our farmers are suffering and it makes no sense that our producers can't sell. But we have these corporations, small, large, in between, it doesn't matter the size, that aren't, aren't buying directly from our producers and aren't giving to our consumers. Our, our farmers are suffering, our communities are suffering because they can't afford the food. So within this conversation, I like to say, do not forget the communities that are suffering. And we talk about all foods and all people, and I'm also gonna stress the African American community because that's where our farmers are suffering, we're down to 1%. And our community members all live in these food deserts. Thank you. My name is Helen Starr. I practice law in private practice in Washington, D.C. for about 30 years. And about a year ago, I changed direction. I went to Italy where I earned a master's degree in food studies at the University of Gastronomic Sciences, which is related to slow food. So I speak today as a consumer and academic and founder of a slow food chapter devoted to the Chesapeake Bay watershed on the eastern shore. Anti-competitive behavior in agriculture has impacts far beyond prices and far beyond negative impacts on small farmers and family farmers. The grip that a monopolistic agriculture has on markets contributes to poor health of Americans. It drives what Americans eat and drives them to eat highly um, processed foods, lacking in variety, and to de depend unnecessarily on inexpensive meat. The production systems of a large-scale monopolistic agriculture are more likely to damage soil, water, and air on a global scale. Failure to enforce antitrust laws in agriculture will therefore eventually contribute to economic decline in the United States. We will have higher health costs and there will be externalities from the large scale farming that have not been paid for by the industry that's created them. Therefore, I urge the Department of Justice and the USDA to enforce the laws for which they have authority and to save the health 
economy, and environment of our nation. Thank you for your time. My name is Cecilia Kluding. I am in high school and I came here from Boulder, Colorado. I missed a day of school to come to talk to you today. I have just returned from the climate talks in Cancun where indigenous farmers south of our border from various ALBA countries report their destruction of their lands and resources by multinational corporations in the industry of mining, gas, and trade agreements. There need to be discussions happening between and or within the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Justice that are addressing the working conditions that these farmers who do, who do much of the labor producing, harvesting, and harvesting the food that we eat, having left a bad situation and entering a bad situation on this side of the border. Specifically, I would like there to be accountability for the stated issues of the Immokalee Farm Workers of Florida and the, Uni and the United Farm Workers of California who, rep who report that their working conditions resemble slave conditions. This is not okay for our country, and I think this needs to... I demand accountability of, on part of the Department of Justice and Agriculture. Thank you. My name, my name is Sienna Chrisman. I'm here from Why Hunger in New York City. Um, I've been to three of the other workshops as well, um, organizing with a larger coalition of, of groups who's, who have been trying to get many voices out to, to speak with you um, as you're conducting this investigation. I'd like today to really echo Chris Waldorp um, from, from this morning's panel when he mentioned that many Americans are being left out of um, the safest and best food system in the world, as another gentleman called it. Um, both obesity and diarrhea-related disease and also SNAP participation are high and growing every day. Both of these are directly related to the cons consolidation of our food system. Nutritious food is too expensive. Producers of fresh and local foods can't get their products into grocery stores. Um, grocery stores have abandoned low-income communities. Many of these issues that we've heard from the other commenters today. We at Why Hunger have been hearing from thousands of our constituents that these issues matter to them too. I'm here, many of us who have commented are here representing thousands, tens of thousands of other people as well for whom these issues are vitally important. We have just submitted almost 11,000 signatures on a comment to the DOJ website um, requesting strong action on this investigation. Those, those 11,000 signatures are part of a, a network of about seven other NGOs who have among us collected almost a quarter of a million signatures, 240,000 signatures on similar comments, which we've all submitted in the past week to you folks, urging you to really take very strong action at the end of this year of investigation, an action which will really benefit both farmers and consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate everyone providing comments. Um, we will um, go to a lunch break right now. Um, we will have another opportunity for people to provide comments later on this afternoon. So you can be free to go to lunch right now. And we, would, we will ask that you um, come back at 1.15 for the, the panel on issues in food retailing. Thank you.